our Lord Jesus Christ is truly King, King of the whole universe, King of all of mankind. But does He reign in your heart? Is He truly your King? Stay with us and see how to have Him reign in your heart. Salve Maria. Salve Maria. Uh, dear friends, welcome back to our reflections on the Sunday liturgies. Today we are going to talk about the, uh, the, the readings for the feast, the solemnity rather, of Christ the King. It is the last Mass in the, of ordinary time in this year. And with this uh, solemnity we close the cycle of year A. We close the liturgical year for this uh, past year. And we start off next Sunday with the first Sunday, Sunday in Advent. As we are dealing with uh, such an exalted figure as Christ the King, which is mar marvelous, exalted, uh, uh, enrapturing figure like that, one brings to mind the great enormous difference between him and the world of today. And also we get into another problem, which is the problem which is rampant today, which is rather completely exaggerated, which is the whole question of egalitarianism, you see. Uh, you must understand that the egalitarianism was used by the devil like that to further all kinds of evil in the history of the church, in the history of the world too. Every most big revolutions, most big changes were done in the line of producing more egalitarianism, more, equal, more equality, etc. With the result that each, of, each one was worse and worse. Uh, this problem began, as a matter of fact, with the well, first parents in the Garden of Eden. As my, as because it is so central to the work of the evil one that he started off right there. And when the dialogue, if you study the dialogue between him and Eve, he said, uh, oh, uh, tell me, um, are you all forbidden to eat all the fruits? He's very sharp. No? Are you forbidden to eat all the fruits of this garden? Uh, and then Eve said, no, no, we are not forbidden like that. We can eat all the fruits we want, except we cannot eat the fruit of the, the tree, uh, of that particular tree there, the, the tree of, of good and of evil. Because if that happens, we will see, we will realize what is the difference between good and evil, and this will, we will die. So God has told us, that has told us that we cannot eat that. The devil answered, no, no, but you can eat that. You will be like God. There's egalitarianism. You equal him to the supreme. He has, he has no right to do that to you, etc., etc. All the sequels which you could gather, as humanity gets worse, this would be more, more loaded, angry, etc., etc. Uh, you, uh, you could be like God. And there, unfortunately, the result, the disastrous result, she ate the forbidden fruit, uh, convinced Adam to do the same, and the rest is history. Uh, the liturgy of this day goes completely against and uh, shows that this myth which is spread throughout the world, that egalitarianism is like the solution for all our problems, a panacea, a remedy which cures everything, like if you just apply egalitarianism. The good people are all egalitarian. Uh, the people who are, the only people who have a right to be good and compassionate and helpful and kind are the egalitarian ones, you see. Especially also, it goes so far that, people, that it is said that to get into heaven you have to be egalitarian. This is, this is ridiculous, you see. But a good person, a, a, a saint, a person who was, who was, uh, who was uh, uh, not egalitarian, but was kind and was good, there are enormous examples of this, quantities of examples of this. Ah, no, that cannot be. This is blackballed, you see. Uh, a person who is great, who has prestige, who is important, but is kind and good, that is taboo. So, uh, this, is what, this is what happens. We can see that if we can talk about this in the liturgy, we have the first reading, is reading of the prophet Ezekiel, when the church uh, approaches, makes similar, a similarity between the figure of the shepherd and the figure of a king. And this shepherd is very kind. He takes care of the sheep, he goes after them, he binds them, the ones that are wounded, uh, he heals the ones that are sick, he goes and finds the ones that are astray and everything. If, uh, if he was equal, if he lowered himself and made himself equal to the sheep, would he be able to do this? No, of course not. Uh, he does not lower himself to do that, to make himself 
equal to the, to the sheep because if he raises himself up higher, he will be able to help them more. He'll be able to give them more counsel. He'll be able to, a, a point of reference to them, a greater benefit for them in all, in all senses. And we'll even have the capacity to judge between the sheep and the goats. And this will be accepted because of his kindness and his, and his prestige. In the second reading, we have St. Paul to the Corinthians. He defends the, the, what God had done, the, de the death and the resurrection. He describes the first fruit of the resurrection is God himself. And he is the first one to resurrect and then uh, the others resurrect in time after his coming in a particular order, in order. So this is all hierarchical, this is all measured, this is all set up in a beautiful scheme, in a beautiful organization. Then he goes to the end so far and says, he will rule and put all under his feet. And when everything is submitted to him, when everything is finally in order and when everything is submitted to him, he himself submits himself, our Lord himself submits himself to the one who can control everything, the one who orders everything, the one who measures everything, which is his divine Father, you see. So he himself, so he's not going to do all of this uh, putting in order just for his own personal benefit. No, because he himself is going to put himself, submit himself to this order, you see. Now, if God submits himself to this order, why are the people who are still egalitarian? Even if God himself submits himself to a hierarchical order and puts himself in order second to he who is supreme above everything, why are still men who are still egalitarian? Finally, we have the gospel, and we have the gospel are the description of those who get into heaven because they did works of charity. They fed the hungry, they gave to drink those who had nothing to drink, they gave clothes to those who, had, who did not have them, etc., etc. And God makes a division between these and the other. The ones that are good ones go with him into heaven, and the others go into down below. Uh, now, we can see that this, these are all, he narrates a series of works of charity. He's, not, he's talking about a series of works of charity. Uh, uh, what happens if someone says, no, I'm going to do charity, but I won't even think about God. I'm not going to invoke God. I'm not going to use the rules of God. I'll do it for some other reason, you see, make charity. Perhaps to make himself more famous or, make, or dr draw attention to himself for other objectives he has in mind or whatever you want. A person who does things like that. What is the worth of what he does to the poor in a case like that, you see? This is, uh, this, is, this, is, this is a question that we, can, that we can very well ask, you see. And therefore, what we have to do uh, is to love Jesus in this, for his divine authority, which is hierarchical and anti-galitarian, because this is the true solution for the chaos in which the world of today is to be found. And this disinterested and submissive love which, uh, which raised itself up will be the peace of Christ in the kingdom of Christ. And that will be the only way that it can be established. It's interesting to note, you might, in concluding, we might ask you, well, Father, could you tell us something of some doctrine of the church or some writing of the church which uh, substantiates this, which puts this in clear order, because we have uh, statements here, a statement there, which are very important, of course. And I would answer affirmatively because we have at the end of the final part of the war and after that, uh, Pope Pius XII had the habit uh, to make allocutions. Every year he made about 12 or 15 of these allocutions to the Roman patriciate and nobility, you see, which give all a series of points of the importance of an elite, the importance of the example that this elite gives to the other people. He goes so far as to say, the nobles who live, they give the ones that give the tone who give the, the standard in the places where they live, in, in the interior, in their, in their houses, in their mansions, which they have inherited for centuries from their, from their relatives, etc. And this is something which is, he vindicates completely as, as uh, a doctrine given by him personally, all of this anti-Galitarian doctrine, which is, which is very important, you see. So I just thought that you would like to know about that, and I would say in ending, that this was the subject of the last book of our founder, Dr. Prina Kurelgiveda, when he wrote about this, because he always, throughout all his life, he had a real admiration for these allocutions of Pius XII to the Roman nobility and patriciate. So with that thought in mind, I will give you my blessing. 
uh, to end this liturgical year and hope to see you uh, next Sunday when we begin Advent. So may Almighty God, with her most blessed mother, uh, bless you and protect you from the evils of egalitarianism and preserve you all in his loving embrace through the intercession of his mother. May Almighty God bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Salve Maria.